It was too good of a music cue for me to uh, not come in right after that. So, hi everybody! Hello! It's bad society now, because Real Brook Wall's in town. Hello, Requiem. Hi, Lo. Hi, Scott and Jess. Um, as always, please let me know if the audio levels are okay for you. We're just playing the music that featured on Sunday's game. Uh, give us all a little feeling of nostalgia up in here. So, welcome everyone. Hi. I will be hosting tonight's RPG clinic. We are going to be discussing Good Society, a Jane Austen RPG that I ran as a one-shot on twitch.tv slash RPG clinic that is right here this past Sunday with the fantabulous players John, Jess, Kate, and Scott. So I thought I would take tonight to um, speak specifically about the prep that went into the game because it was quite extensive and I opted not to show that on stream to optimize playtime. Uh, and I also want to talk, of course, about how the game ran, uh, things that I would have done differently, uh, and about the game, the system, mechanics that I chose to cut or simplify for purposes of time, and answer any questions that you might have about the game because I know there are a lot of Austin fans among us and maybe some new fans after Sunday, hopefully. So that's what I'm here for. And the players um, are in chat, or at least a, a good chunk of them are. So if you have any questions that uh, pertain specifically to them, feel free to tag them. Ah, sound is in your left ear again? No. God damn it. Ah, all right, hold on. Can I fix that? Test, 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 test. Is it better now? Test, test, test. Is it better now? Test, 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 test. And high crosshair, by the way. Yay! Okay, great. So. <laughs> Good society. This adorable little book is created by Story Brewers Role Playing, and I'm gonna link them in the chat right now so that you can check out their content. Uh, and as their website suggests, their mandate is to create games with a narrative heart. And if there's one thing I can say about this game, uh, it is that it has a lot of heart. And it is clear that it was made with love and with people who really care about the setting and the history and the time period uh, because it, it jumps off the page. How uh, nerdy they all are about Regency times, which is great because so am I. So it was a match made in heaven. Uh, some, I think several of you in Discord tagged this book um, or this specific system for me to check out and thank you thousand times for that uh, because I've been watching and reading Jane Austen content for a very long time. It was my angsty teenage years when everyone's like, oh, no one understands me and they're listening to Sum 41. I was reading Jane Austen. I'm sure many of you can relate. So yeah. Ooh, Crosshair, the bot's down today. Whoops. Didn't get it set up in time. Da 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 da. So, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> so this is the hard copy of the book. Having said that, you can buy the PDF and you can buy uh, all of the digital content through their website. I opted for the hard copy. I'm very glad that I did. Full disclosure, it was not cheap because it shipped from Australia, but I'm still happier to have it. So I don't regret anything. I also got me. The other thing I ordered in hard copy, uh, the base deck, the Good Society cards. And I am going to talk about this a little more, but just so that you get a sense, uh, this includes things like connection cards, just extra flavor basically, but also 
desire cards and relationship cards and we're gonna get into that but you can get them in digital form as well but I happened to choose to buy them all in the hard copy hi John so the game at its heart is about collaborating to tell a story in the Jane Austen style. It's very, very heavily um, weighted on the role-playing uh, side. There is no dice, no dice rolling. There's no check. Uh, there are no checks to be done. Uh, and even the character sheets are quite um, pared down. And the game can be run with a facilitator who's sort of the stand-in for a game master, but is really more of a, I call it a referee meets a stage manager. So it's their job to adjudicate decisions, to manage time, to encourage player collaboration and consent and respect, uh, and also to ask them questions that would help um, add further richness and life to the story. So uh, for example, if Scott were to say, okay, um, I'm going to I'm going to leave the drawing room. I'm like, okay, so uh, do you take one last look at anybody before you leave? And are you leaving happily with new excitement or are you leaving despondent? And then that might draw him out to further describe his action a little bit more. So after taking one last languishing look at Lavinia, I sweep out of the drawing room and make my way sadly with a melancholy air down the drafty hallway. And uh, then that's just all of us faint on our couches. <clears throat> so, oh, okay, I'm gonna start interacting with the chat now, cause that's my, that's my spiel about the game. Crosshair, the one thing I really liked about this game is that it requires rather little from the GM, so it'd be a great way to bring someone into leading the game. I 100% agree. I've run games with JTE for kids, um, which is very simplified GMing, but I do have a little bit ex of experience in that regard. But I was quite nervous about running a game on RPG Clinic for such talented uh, role players as this group of people. So Good Society is a very forgiving game, especially if you've done the prep, especially if you've done the work and you know the world. But my sister was like, you could recite persuasion in your sleep, you're going to be fine. And she was right, uh, because if you're a huge nerd, that really helps. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. You're right that the actual gameplay doesn't require a lot from the GM. You probably still need someone to explain the game to the players, though. So yes, it is the GM's job, the facilitator's job, to know the game better than anyone else. That is standard. <laughs> Um, and it is their job to prep. So I'm going to walk you through now what I did to prep for Good Society. First thing I did was I read the book. Easy. It's laid out in very helpful chapters. Um, collaboration, backstory, rules of play, cycles of play. Uh, chapter six is all about what it means to be a facilitator because there is also the option of running games without a facilitator. I would actually say that our group did quite well in terms of managing the lengths of scenes and adjudicating our own decisions. So if I were to run it again for this specific group, I don't think we would need a facilitator necessarily. Maybe if we were streaming because that person manages the music, but otherwise you can kind of run it yourselves as long as everybody is respectful and aware of the time and then everybody has a major character to play play sets role playing in jane austen's world characters and knowing austen there is so much useful history in this book that really helps you uh, get into the world that you're about to be embodying um there's stuff about proper dinner party etiquette. There's stuff about uh, gala party etiquette and um, the different uh, classes, um, the hierarchy 
that exist in the Regency times, what it meant to be rich, how much money that actually meant, where it came from, what the different um, areas of employment meant. So, from what it sounds like, a player could double as a facilitator should the need arise. That's another thing, Requiem, thank you for reminding me. The facilitator can also play a major character themselves. So I could have had a character that I myself was controlling and been the facilitator. I probably would have made my own role a little bit smaller just so I could still oversee everything. Uh, but that's definitely possible too. It was just, it was a little too much for me to consider for the first time running it, but now I think I have a pretty decent handle. Also, I simplified it a lot. So I read through everything. The chapter on play sets talked about basically how much, um, how much of the prep, how much of these pre-built systems you would pull from the, the game itself, from what the creators have already made for you. A playset is very simple and you can take it from, uh, you can take one of the book's full playsets or you can use it in part. A playset consists of a desire card, <clears throat> like this. A desire card has a Jane Austen quote on the front. They were as strangers, worse than strangers, for they could never become acquainted. And then on the back it says, convince your parent to accept you as their legitimate child and declare your relation to all the world. Though biology dictates that a child requires two parents, you have never beheld evidence of more than one. Born out of wedlock, your wealthier and more powerful progenitor refused to acknowledge you from an early age. Now the time has come for a family reunion, and be it by charm, favors, or less savory means, you will find a way to have them acknowledge you as their own progeny. So that is a desire card. It does not, yeah, so it does not include a, a mandatory relation card, but if you were to pull from one of the play sets that the game has, they basically say, pull these desires, pull these relationships, and a relationship is something like this, a patron. The taker of this card is the patron of the giver. It's as easy as that. So when you're in the backstory uh, chapter of creating this, you select a desire, which also comes with a relationship, be it patron, be it sister, be it parent, uh, former flame, uh, secret fiance, you give that to somebody else around the table and they take it from you. So the giver of the card is, uh, you know, the taker of the card is the patron of the, of the giver kind of thing. So by the end, everybody should have uh, a card, two cards, a desire and a relationship. And then you can also uh, go further in that when you're pre-making a playset, because this is all stuff that the facilitator can do in prep, is um, there are also character roles that you can pre-assign to different desires. For example, for example, the new arrival. Wherever it is you were in these past years, it was certainly nothing like here. These people are strange to you, their habits, manners, and views as if lifted from a theater play. Still, to the outsider comes the gift of objective observation. You view their dramas as a spectator, able to see what the actors cannot. It's a skill you will need if you are to prove your own ambitions among them. So if I wanted to do all the prep, say, Say we only have three hours to play a one-shot and all of my players aren't available to meet up earlier. In our case, we met up a week earlier and everybody chose their desires and established their relationships and created their roles. If I didn't have the luxury of that, I would just say, okay, option number one uh, is the desire to um, be 
acknowledged by the parent who's never who's never publicly accepted you. And that goes with the relationship of patron. And the role is the new arrival. And then the last element is backstory. Uh, and that is basically what your familial and financial situation is. So in this case, ill reputed. Your family is being plagued by scandal and it's very difficult for you to get suitable employment or make suitable marriage matches. So if I decided that I wanted to group all of that together, that would become character packet number one. And then I could make another packet. That's character packet number two. They have a whole different set of circumstances and traits. Um, so I would make that. I would make one for each player at our table and then one extra in case there was one that didn't resonate with anybody, you'd have a spare to swap out. And then everyone would just choose the one that they liked the best. The great thing about these cards, and um, John and <coughs> Kate and Scott and Jess commented on it, is they all sound so fun that you don't really feel like any of them suck. <sighs> oh, that's the end of my playlist. Let me just... Perfect. So, yeah, that's, you could do a lot of prep, a lot of prep as a facilitator, but you could also do some prep in that area, trust your character or trust your, um, your PCs, your, your, your players to decide other things during this backstory session if you have that time. Um, honestly, this system of character creation sounds useful for any game, to be honest, even if it's just one part of creation. I agree, because it forces you to go into the game with a desire. You know what type, like, you know where you fall in society. You already have a major relationship with another character. Uh, and you know what your family and, and money status is. So, very useful. And that's what's called using, um, like operating with a full playset. Is if you give your players all of this, these pre-created, fully developed roles that they can flesh out themselves. In my case, I worked with a partial playset. So I actually chose one of the examples from the book, but I cut it in half. So I just pre-chose desire and bundled that with relationship everyone got to choose that but then i passed around all of the character roles and all of the um uh the backstory no the yeah like the the familial money stuff like the ill reputed passed that around the table and had people choose i trust them they did not let me down it was a smooth process with no arguing So I definitely recommend that if you don't have the luxury of two hours. I think this took us about two hours to build our characters. So let's say that everybody has chosen their, desi chosen their desire, they have their relationship, they have their character role, and they have their background. The next step is to flesh everything out. Easy. Okay. I am the new arrival, or Scott, Scott's the new arrival. Scott, where did you arrive from? Okay, cool. What is your character's name? Great. Do you have employment or are you wealthy? If you are wealthy, are you, uh, do you come from family money? Or uh, is your family in trade? Are you in trade? Are you poor? Are you looking to make uh, a good marriage. We know that you want to get acknowledged by this parent. Are they wealthy? Are you going to go undercover in their household to try to endear yourself to them? So these are questions that as a facilitator, you ask all of the players at your table to really draw out their ideas and come up with something very meaty and substantial. <sighs> 
And then, the only other things you need to figure out in prep are settings. So when I was giving everybody these different characters and we were building them together, I did give them two settings. Everybody, this takes place centrally at the estate of Maple Grove, which is located near the small village of Habershire. This is in the United Kingdom. These locations are both fictional. Blech. I did a uh, dubbing session this morning that was all screaming. I'm starting to feel it. If I suddenly die, that's why. Or cough, you know, whatever. Um, so I asked everybody to tie themselves to one of these locations. So if you are tied to the estate, maybe you are a member of that prestigious, wealthy family, like John was. Maybe you work there, like Scott did. <laughs> maybe you live in town, like Kate did. Or in Jess's case, she asked if she could live at a neighboring estate. So we created one and she named it Elderberry Ridge. Great, she lives in a cottage on a neighboring estate that's not quite as grand as Maple Grove, but still very lovely, very well situated. And it was a fun thing about Jess's character, Lavinia, that she's not really that well off. She's sort of depending on the kindness of her aunt. So any party, that her aunt does not attend, Lavinia would not get the use of the carriage. So she would have to walk. So we established that it was several hours walk between uh, one place and the other. I think we settled on two. It was like a, it's like a lengthy thing and that Lavinia was self-conscious enough about her appearance that she would have to be cleaning the mud off of her boots so that no one would see that she'd been walking through the field and all of that. But it was a fun little, a uh, little extra bit of flavor to add to her character. And I think that Jess played that really well. This, this person who's very concerned with appearances. And I was thrilled when John said that he wanted to be a part of the family of Maple Grove. And he was like, he's looking at the book where they list the peerage. Um, earls and the barons and all that and he's like i think i want to be an earl like, okay here we go and named it lord elton starling i mean how good is that right so kate's character kit alexander lives in haversher with their foster mother their aunt um and their aunt is a uh, seamstress and tailor. So Kit, Kit's family has money, but they themselves uh, have no title. It's not from old money, it's new money. Uh, so maybe they don't have the same prestige that some of the older families might hold, but their money is arguably a little more secure because it comes from trade, because it comes from services and goods. And then Scott was the tutor, Patrick Beaumont, the tutor at Maple Grove Estate and trusted friend and confidant and maybe more of Lord Elton Starling. Scott says great characters attribute to the creativity of the players and the GM, as well as the ingenuity of the system that throws you a grab bag of traits and says, go. That's another thing you could probably put all the desires in a hat all the relationships in a hat, close your eyes and pick. And from what you create, you could definitely explain it into a really compelling character. <laughs> yeah. The cards really left a lot of room for, um, for our own ideas, which is, uh, you know, I'm singing the book's praises, but I would say that's the best thing. Like, the book somehow manages to be incredibly rich with like with information and with things that you can use and with lore uh, and it's very evocative and then at the same time it's like but by the way these are just ideas or 
the desire card will have two sentences and you can really add whatever you want to it. It would translate well to stage. Yes, it would, Jess. Yes, it would. Oh, that'd be a great improv show. Jess. Speaking of all of these players. Eh. Let's talk a bit about collaboration. I think it was pretty clear that everybody was working very well together. They were very respectful of each other's characters and ideas on Sunday, which is all any GM or facilitator could possibly want. <coughs> and the book makes it that very clear too. They say everybody at the table is working together to create a story. It's not about giving your character the best plot. It's not about winning. It's not about beating somebody else, even if they're your rival. You're supposed to kind of look at it from a removed, amused perspective of an author. Because even though you're playing a character, you should care just as much what happens to Jess's character and what her character arc looks like. And then at the end, you name the book that you all wrote together. It's quite lovely. Oh yes, this is my Jane Austen mug. Scott very kindly made me tea and put it in this mug. Oh, thanks. So, I mean, I don't have a lot to say about collaboration other than I would strongly encourage everybody use this mindset in as many games as possible moving forward because uh, it was really nice to go in. You're like, no mechanics. There's no, there are no like skill values or anything like that. It's just, you're working together. You're writing a great story. In our case, you're writing a story in two and a half to three hours. We name it, stamp it, it's done. Jess says collaboration was definitely a helpful part of this. So fun to have backstories the next part, but we already talked about that, I think. Of course, if you have any questions, do not hesitate. Mention the play sets. Um, oh, another thing. So let me just backstory here. Okay. Um, connections. So connections um, is pretty much the last thing that you want to do in character development, which is everybody gets a little piece of paper. <clears throat> it's small like this. Thank you for the follow, Delirious DM. Name, relationship, major character, opinion, age, played by. This little card you fill out for your own major character as a connection in their life. So let's say that um, this new arrival came here with his sister, his younger sister. And her name is Eleanor, relationship, younger sister, major character. I write my own name, so that's, let's say it's Jasper. Major character, Jasper. Opinion. So what is Eleanor's opinion of Jasper? Let's say she finds him far too serious, wishes he would have more fun with life. Cool. Age. Uh, she's younger, so let's say she's 16. Played by. Aha! So everybody's made one of these cards now. There's also a little bit of extra space at the bottom where you can add in some more flavor text. Um... Then you all have a collaborative discussion with the group to decide who would best play this connection. Don't worry about gender. Don't worry about age. It's more about who, like, if this person's already a relation, like, if, if Scott 
is already a major uh, relationship to Jasper, Scott's character, then maybe he shouldn't also play Jasper's connection. Because that means that a lot of our scenes are going to be together and we want to involve everybody. So maybe Jess is like, hey, you know, I'm probably not going to be appearing in, uh, in the same scenes as Eleanor, so why don't I take it? Great. Everybody passes out the cards, we assign the roles like that, and kind of talk through it. The fun thing is, if it turns out that Jess's character, let's say it's Lavinia for the purposes of this, Lavinia and Eleanor were ever going to be in the same scene, Jess just hands Eleanor's card over to me, and I take care of it. Or the facilitator, whoever they may be, takes care of it. The facilitator handles extra roles, connections, NPCs, anything that needs to be done. Like a stage manager who just magically fixes everything all the fucking time. So that's collaboration. <laughs> the only mechanic is to stop, collaborate, and listen. Well, that is a, a very simplified version <laughs> of the game. But, <laughs> where are my cycles? Okay. There are also cycles. The novel chapter is the, is the first chapter of a cycle. And that is when the role playing happens. That's when you set the scene. Okay, we're at, oh yeah, this is actually, let me fix that there, put that there, aha. Uh -huh. We start out at a ball at Maple Grove Estate. Everyone is there. People are speaking within the ball, they go to different rooms, people visit each other afterwards. That's all the novel chapter. It ends when I say it does. Then the second chapter is reputation. Yeah, I know, John, it's been too long. Sometimes I pull up those videos of stage manager saying five minutes please five minutes because i miss it anyway hey <laughs> uh reputation is a little more involved than what i made it in the game um because there are things called reputation tags which can be applied to your character and they are either positive or negative and they can affect how society views your character in positive or negative ways. Because it was a one-shot, I chose to simplify that to just let's all talk about some scandalous things that our characters may have done in the last novel chapter and try to bring that in. So in John's case, it was the fact that he paid way too much attention to Kit and Lavinia and Patrick at the ball and didn't really schmooze as much with the others as his mother would have liked. The next phase is rumor and scandal. Now this chapter is very fun, but once again, I opted to skip it because of time. You go around the circle. The first person creates a rumor. The second person has the option to either spread that rumor or start another one. And you continue along and you add it all down on your trusty sheet. So you keep track of what rumors are circulating in society. Now, if you play multiple sessions of this game, rumors that are not spread will eventually fade. Um, and uh, they, will, they will prove to be like unsubstantiated and stuff. And they'll like flitter away in the wind. So that's rumor and scandal in a nutshell. Then epistolary phase. Great, great phase. You go around the circle, everybody writes a letter. They just speak a letter out loud to either a major character or a connection or an NPC, short, and it gives extra insight into where their character's at right now. <clears throat> and then there's a no another novel chapter, then a reputation, and then another rumor and scandal, and then an epistolary. And that is one cycle. So those chapters times two essentially equals one cycle. 
when you're wrapping up the game, you don't do rumor and scandal again because you're not gonna spread rumors if there isn't another role-playing section to follow it. And the epistolary becomes the epilogue. So instead of writing letters, you're writing your character's epilogue. <laughs> Thank you, Grozer. <laughs> and yes, it's true. I did do a lot of editing, and I'm glad that I did, because I still got to show off how great this system is without needing to get too bogged down in what the different chapters entail. And if you ever run a longer form of this, you can absolutely take all the time to pass through these different chapters as you want, um, because you'll have that time, and you're not streaming with a deadline and time limits and stuff. So that is what one cycle of play is. I think an ideal game would last maybe three cycles. And what you witnessed on Sunday was one, was essentially one cycle of play, which took about two and a half to three hours. So three cycles of play would be three sessions to craft a nice little arc, but you could also make it longer if you wanted to. <clears throat> so that's play. I already talked about backstory. I need to talk about that. Ooh, but I do. I do want to talk about this. I want to talk about liberties because guess what the book is also great about saying that you can be as strictly tied to the conventions of the time or you can be as loosey-goosey as you want it's up to you so we opted to be pretty loosey-goosey when it came to gender roles i put out a little google uh google questionnaire to everybody before and was like, how historically accurate do you think we should be? Um, and everyone opted with moderately accurate, but if there's something we don't know, we're not going to freak out and look it up. We're just going to make an executive decision and move on, which is what we did with um, the polo question, actually. Uh, another question was, what kind of tone do you want the game to have? It can be farce, dramatic, or romantic comedy. That's actually in the book. Uh, we opted for romantic comedy, which is the suggested one for your first game and for a classic Austin experience. But I think farce would be a lot of fun. <laughs> um, and then another question was, how do you feel about the, the, how do you feel about gender roles? Do you want this to be a patriarchy? Do you want this to be a matriarchy? Or do you want to do away with the traditional gender roles and say that anybody can have any employment, anybody can marry, Anyone can inherit property, that kind of stuff. And uh, everyone voted for option three. So that's what we did. And um, we also made it that uh, relationships do not have to be heteronormative. Um, we made it that the characters do not need to be cisgendered either. So uh, this is why we had a non-binary major character which was really excellent because you're doing a little bit of mental reconfiguring and I do acknowledge that at times there was some misgendering done um, and we did do our best and we'll always strive to be better. But it worked out so well. You don't have to worry about, oh, there's no eldest son in this family, so I guess the daughters will inherit nothing. Instead, I just went, okay, whoever's the eldest child inherits everything. Great. Um, when two people get married, the one who, who, uh, there's the one who proposes and the one who accepts and the one who accepts will be the one to bring the dowry as opposed to it automatically being the woman. Um, and we, we determined that the formal address for Kit Alexander would be Misk Alexander. Great. Easy. Um, so if that is something that you are tempted by, but feel like the game would not allow it, it very much does. And it's kind of cool because you're sort of like rewriting some elements of history. 
Uh, M-I-S-C. Thank you very much, Kate. So those were the liberties that we take. And by the way, um, Good Society also said characters can be of any race. Straight up. So that's another thing. Uh, ooh, what are you eating, Kate? I'm almost done, to be honest, because I'm zooming through this. I also don't know how much longer my voice will last, so this this is great. <laughs> Research! This is the fun stuff. This is when you get to watch Jane Austen films and read the books. Read the core book. Where they say... <laughs> what do they say? Dinner was the most important meal of the day in Regency society. Dinners of the gentry could be extravagant and take several hours. It was usual to have friends and family over for a simple dinner, but when guests were due, the lady of the house and her, and her housekeeper might pull out all the stops. Dinner parties weren't expected to be an every night affair. However, when there was a party, the gentry would go all out. A dinner party would start with a procession, in, a procession into the dining room, led by the gentleman of the house and the most senior lady in attendance. They would be followed by the hostess and the most important guests, followed by any senior, married individuals and couples, and finally the young singles. So it goes on by that, it talks about multiple courses and what order it would go in, it talks about how they carve the meat and how they serve everybody. Um, then it talks about the ladies retiring to the drawing room and the gentlemen would, would drink port and partake of their pipes. Two poor lovers race to propose so they won't be forced to bring a dowry that they worry will disappoint their lover. Every time they hear their intended starting to propose, they make an excuse to flee. <laughs> I love that. That'd be hilarious. Jess. Jess, write it down. <laughs> Jess just like has a quill. Like, uh, she's writing an improv because that's how improv works, you see. Um, <laughs> you write it down. <laughs> uh, oh, let's do the romance playlist. Ooh, that's cool, Crosshair. They didn't talk about that um, in the book. If each course of the meal had certain had certain topics, but that makes me want to look into it more because that that was one option. You could do like crazy historical accuracy where if you didn't know something, you would look it up and everyone would do quite a bit of research into their characters before playing, which also sounds like a buttload of fun. <laughs> so. Having played things that I would do differently. Um, now that I have experience facilitating and playing with this particular group of people, I don't think I would... Maybe I wouldn't make a play set at all. Maybe I would let everyone choose randomly and see what happened. Possibly. It's possible that then you would have people with two similar desires and then it wouldn't really work, but I wonder what a completely randomized character roll-up would look like. You also close your eyes and choose your role and all that stuff. Um, it was hard on stream to differentiate between the major character and the connections when people were playing. So Scott suggested something like holding up the connection card when you are speaking as them, or maybe having a costume element, like maybe somebody has glasses or a hat. Because that got a little bit confusing. I wasn't sure how that was gonna play, so that's something to think about for next time. Um, I think now I'm comfortable enough that I would uh, have a major character myself. 
and I found that actually the 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 action of the story ramped up in a very fun way. So I don't know if I would change anything about the pacing at the beginning, but we were all just so leisurely at the start and having nice long conversations and it was lovely and very Austinian. And then at the end, it started to rain and then everything went balls to the wall because I think we all realized we were running out of time and then everything happened all at once. But that was very exciting too. But I might play around with managing these like scenes that are more just conversational but aren't super dramatic or aren't more dramatic. If we skim those down, then does that mean that more dramatic things would happen for more people um, throughout the course of the evening? The rain was brilliant. It was a super cool way to go. Well, Crosshair, I can't take credit for that because in the Google questionnaire, I concluded with, and if there are any scenes or any moments that you particularly want to play out, write it here. And somebody wrote, I would really like a scene in the rain, a scene in the pouring rain. And so at the garden party, I looked at the time and went, all right, so I either start a new day and have it raining, or I take this opportunity, everybody's outside, let's make it rain and see what happens. And <laughs> lots of stuff happened, so I'm very pleased. <laughs> It was, uh, yeah. Well done, individual <laughs> who wrote that on their questionnaire. Um, do the players have anything that they want to suggest um, in terms of the system, in terms of tweaking things? For Let's start with for another one-shot because a lot of allowances were made for a one-shot. I, for one, would also run a longer game, having experienced it. That's something I would do differently in the future. Try running it over multiple sessions. <laughs> I'd like there to be a fire. Well, I could have given you a, a fire in the drawing room, in the fireplace. Would that be good? I mean, Jess wanted to be a vampire, so... I had to say, yes, Lavinia can be a vampire, but it's complete secret and no one can know. <laughs> Ooh, the tokens! Thank you, Kate! <laughs> okay, so, many things. Yes, token usage. Resolve tokens and monologue tokens. We started using them more as the game um, concluded but resolve tokens are a currency to affect the story in a dramatic way and you can give them to other people to encourage their characters to do something um if someone says hey liz i think that the countess should um fall in a marmot hole and hurt her ankle so she can't attend the ball tonight and i can go hmm okay but lord wesley should feel so bad that he also skips the ball to attend to me and then the person's like, fine. And then I take the token and then such comes to pass. It's pretty cool. And it encourages this like, this collaboration element. Where do the day is? Collaboration, nope, too late. Um, and then the monologue tokens is uh, pretty much exactly as it sounds. It's uh, something dramatic or maybe not dramatic has happened. You can use your token play it and say, hey Jess, I'd like to know what Lavinia is thinking right now. Now Patrick has just insulted her. What is she thinking? Now Jess would probably say, I'm thinking how alluring the uh, the blood pumping at his neck looks. And I'm thinking how I would like to just dive in there and, uh, and end his life. And then I would go, Jess, remember, we're in a Regency period show, like maybe tone it down. She's like, okay, I've never been so offended in my entire life. I thought we were friends. I'm like, great, thank you. At, for, for example. <laughs> yeah. Jess, did you? 
Did you take into account the vampire stuff? Like, I can't remember. Was Lavinia always wearing a hat outside? I bet she was. I wouldn't put it past you. I think you spent most of your time in the shade. <laughs> and you were stranded in the rain. <laughs> Three Sunday Jane Austen game. I'd totally be down with that. I'd even go as far as to say I would write letters to the game via Lord Wiggly Taint. Yes, Lord Wiggly Taint never attends any of the galas at Maple Grove. Everyone's starting to wonder what happened to him. No comment from the vampire. So I guess we'll never know. Lavinia is a creature of mystery. <laughs> of course, yes, he's very busy and important. So yes, uh, I would certainly try to encourage token usage from the beginning. And I think the best way to do that is to lead by example. So I started the monologue token usage and that worked out really well. Um, so yeah, I think just if you're the facilitator or if you're a player who's familiar with the system, you're tempted to use your resolve token, just do it. And then the people around you will be empowered to do the same. Ah, oh, just thank you. It's really kind. I don't know what to do with praise. Seriously, I don't. She wore a large hat. She was only outside with Biff the boss. In the late evening, she carried stuff around that required two people. It's true, Jess, you were strong enough to carry all that shit. Um, oh, right, that reminds me. Oh, let me see if I can find it. Jess, I want you to see this. Hold on. Because there's a, um, an expansion, shall we say, to good society uh, that is called Gothic Society, a gothic horror expansion for good society by Jean Astadon. And it was, uh, it was retweeted by Story Brewers. Here we go. So, you know. <laughs> if we did want to play again, I'm just saying it wouldn't be the exact same game. It would be slightly different. And Lavinia could come back. <laughs> oh, thank you, Crosshair. <laughs> you do, you do, Kate. I do, too. Kate's like, I have been stage manager and assistant stage manager. I have so much black clothing. Please let me wear it. I will play Gothic Society if I can be a whiny college dropout genius obsessed with mastery over life and death. Sounds good to me. So, having heard this conversation, and most of you have seen the game on Sunday, is this a system you feel like you want to run or participate in? And if so, do you have any ideas about setting? And whether you would use a full play set or, complete, or a, a half, or if you would be the facilitator, or if you would create a major character and have no facilitator. I want to know. I'm curious. My name will be Frankenstein. <laughs> Gothic society. I would be a panda infiltrating human society as a goth. Kate would love to see a full three to six session campaign. I would too. Those long arcs. Those longing glances that last for session after session and nobody acts upon it until session five and then they're torn apart by circumstance and then suddenly session six, they're back together, triumphant reunion. Yes, that shit's my jam. <laughs> I would be totally down to play even via voice chat a Jane Austen game. No promises on how serious I could be. You know, I got a sense from your name Lord Wiggly Taint, that you were not particularly disposed to the seriousness? Just a hunch? 
<laughs> I would definitely be interested in playing. Probably the plucky young governess striking out on her own. Ooh, Lemon Eater, I love it. I would totally play this but as a murder mystery with a comical touch. Uh, actually, this system, I think, would lend itself quite well to that. You would have to put the murder mystery, like, you'd have to insert clues and motives and stuff into the game. But the system itself, I think the structure would work pretty well. The epistolary, like, <laughs> the epistolary could have everybody dictating a very suspicious letter. <laughs> but you're still not quite sure who did it. <laughs> I like it. Mr. Boffin's in the kitchen with the pistol. Oh, I forgot the mansions at Sag Bottom Lane. How could I forget? <laughs> well, I mean, that might be it for me. Because I got through all of my topics and I mean, I think I've I think I've sung the game's praises pretty well. Ooh, another thing that I did during uh during character creation and backstory, I brought my laptop, I had open a Google Doc, I wrote down <laughs> John, Kate, Scott, Jess. And then I wrote, Jess, major character, Lavinia Star, uh, Lavinia Varney, uh, role, socialite. Like I wrote everything down and then I shared that doc with everybody else so they could all have access to it. Um, because our character sheets aren't super, uh, complex, I don't, yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, super, they're, they're, yeah, aren't super complex. Uh, that was just a great way of, of um, centralizing all of the info. So I'd recommend doing that too. And it also means you can have that open as the facilitator to remind yourself of everybody's names and the connections that they're playing and how the relationships are connected too. Because I can guarantee you will forget. It's way more names to remember than you think. <laughs> I have a feeling I would play a cynical butler that has some major grievances with this patron. <laughs> Are you gonna poison your patron? When in Regency. Oh, that Wiggly Taint's horrible with names? Or that you have, like, a piece of paper where you write down people's names on them? <laughs> well, on Sunday we are going to have something very different from this past Sunday because we are doing episode zero of Star Wars Reach. We're, we're embarking on a brand spanking new campaign, friends. Pew pew in the space space. Get excited. Our characters are mostly created. Our credits are mostly spent. Yeah, mostly. We uh, have done some sample combat. It went not great. <laughs> which should be very entertaining for all of you. Join our Discord server. Get involved. Ask me any more questions that you have about Good Society. If you buy the PDF, please let me know uh, because I would love to talk to you about your game. Just jump into the Elizabeth A. Neal channel and talk to me. And let's talk about Jane Austen. Seriously, I will talk about it all the time. Saturday is a possible stardew. We will keep you posted on that. Something's going to be happening at three, that's for sure. Ahem. Tomorrow night, there is Punchy at 6 p.m. We are finishing up the main plot, hopefully, of Horizon Zero Dawn. Ahem. 
And then Sunday is Star Wars at 6. Shit. Thank you, Crosshair, for your motto rating skills. Do, 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 do. Oh, Trey Dog, hello. Yes. But if you have any questions about the game, vomit them in here, and I will answer before I leave. Otherwise. Thank you for joining me. Oh, Trey Dog has one. Kate, what was the context of that quote, though? And thank you, Jess and John and Kate and Scott, for being such amazing, generous, uh, and respectful players. The best players a facilitator could ask for. Uh, yeah, you are probably right. He, he, he. I press what? Brom, what? Why, Scott? <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Scott, why don't you answer? And I will listen to the rest of Bourré on the Fancy and Important Person playlist. We didn't really have too many, like, fancy and important people who were really uh, commanding the way that Lady Catherine de Bourgh was commanding. So next time I'm going to make sure there's, like, a dowager in there. Oh, I see how it is. Ghost Owl Studios, thank you for the follow. We're just wrapping up our talk on Good Society. And I appreciate you joining and following because we're starting a Star Wars campaign on Sunday. Hello! So Scott says I do most of my work, like my writing, by dumping a bunch of words on a page and then going away and thinking about it, rolling it around in my head. That's how many of us do it, actually. Yeah, word vomit everything and then uh, walk away for several days, weeks, months. Oh yeah, the music was huge. Last thing that I did to prep was create all of these uh, playlists. Very, very pleased that I did that. Playlists are called Balls and General Merriment, Platonic Meeting, Melancholy, Romance, pre-show of course, and Fancy and Important Person. So when I got to John and Kate's, I downloaded the playlist. I'm sorry, they had already downloaded the playlist and it plugged them into the music player for me. And then I added comments next to each track that said specifically what type of track it was. So, um, for example, um, I think it was this one. So this, this track that's playing now, I said this um, background for dinner or conversation because it's not quite a dancing tune, but it would be really lovely in the background of dinner. So sure enough, when the dinner scene started, boop! And I'm very pleased at past Liz for doing that. It made it a lot easier. <laughs> okay, friends. Oh, that's great, Ghost Owl. Well, best of luck. That's so exciting that you're working on a tabletop RPG. I have uh, I have tons of respect for people who create them because they are not easy and creating a good one is even harder, which is why for the last time before signing off, I'm gonna promote Good Society by Story Brewers. I'm gonna throw the link in the chat one more time. Highly recommend for Jane Austen fans or for people who love Regency. Fair. <clears throat> and you joined the Discord. Hooray! Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining me, everybody. And thank you for your questions, for your generosity, for your good vibes on this Good Society Day. Hopefully it is not the end of it. 
We'll catch you on the flippity floppity. Bye!